Good morning and welcome to the first of four webinars in ISAP's Ecosystem Market Summer Series. My name is Jean Brokish and it is my pleasure to welcome you today. I am the Midwest Program Manager for American Farmland Trust and I'm joined today by my co-host Dr. Emily Bruner, the Midwest Science Director. We are also joined by Beth Frazier, of American Farmland Trust. She is the National Agricultural Land Network Manager. Uh, Beth is assisting us with technical support during today's webinar. And um, the three of us, as I mentioned, work for American Farmland Trust, which is a national nonprofit organization whose mission is to save the land that sustains us by protecting farmland, promoting sound farming practices, and keeping farmers on the land. American Farmland Trust is a founding member of the Illinois Sustainable Ag Partnership, or ISAP, which is a group of 13 organizations working together to improve soil health and reduce nutrient loss by accelerating the adoption of conservation practices. Our work in Illinois would not be possible without partnerships like this, and I'd like to thank members of ISAP for helping plan today's event, especially the Illinois corn growers, Illinois Soybean Association, University of Illinois Extension, the Agricultural Drainage Management Coalition, and the Nature Conservancy. And I'd like to give special recognition to Megan Baskerville from the Nature Conservancy for her assistance behind the scenes. Uh, Megan is running our slide deck today. This forum would also not be possible without the collaboration and support from our partner organizations from Iowa, Indiana, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Individuals from these organizations were, were critical to the success of our February forum, which some of you may have attended, and their continued engagement and help to plan and promote our summer series is much appreciated. And of course, we appreciate the fact that you've joined us. More than 400 people registered for today's webinar, including farmers, loan officers, agronomists, researchers, and a wide variety of professionals working in Oh, we've set aside the last half of the webinar for Q&A with our presenters. Um, so let us know what you want to know by using the question bar to ask questions that come to you anytime during today's webinar. You can also use that question bar to alert staff of any tech issues you might be having, including apparently I was just muted temporarily. I'm not sure how that happened, so apologies for that. I also want to thank today's presenters who have worked with us to develop presentations that go beyond the typical marketing pitch and address some of the questions that we've been hearing from farmers and farm advisors. So today we're joined by Lisa Streck of Bayer, Emma Fuller of Corteva, and Sally Fliss of Nutrien. I'll provide more information on each of today's presenters, but first I'm going to pass it over to Emily to help set the stage. Thank you, Jean, uh, and thank you again to everyone for joining us today. Um, I'd just like to briefly introduce ISAP's vision for this webinar series, highlighting our three major objectives, uh, which include engaging farmers, ag retailers, and advisors, and other conservation and agricultural professionals in the exploration of ecosystem market opportunities, uh, transparent and accessible presentation of market incentives, and then just increased confidence among farmers in evaluating new programs. Uh, we'd also like to stress that we're not endorsing these programs or companies, uh, nor are we promoting one opportunity or, over another. Uh, we merely just want to facilitate data sharing among our combined farmer networks and help folks make their own decisions about what may or may not be right on their farms. Next slide, please. So, you know, we've been overwhelmed with the level of interest and support we've received uh, in organizing this webinar series, and we are very, very grateful to all our presenters, as well as the featured presenters today, uh, for their time and effort behind the scenes to ensure that this webinar is as informative uh, as possible. So we employed three main strategies in building the content uh, for these webinars, involving curating questions from our combined farmer networks um, in an attempt to anticipate some of those key questions that producers and ag 
professionals may have. Uh, summarizing the responses from each um, of the presenters today in a side-by-side -side comparison table for quick reference, and then asking each presenter to walk the audience through a hypothetical farmer scenario to help demonstrate how each program offering and experience may differ. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, we did we have put together a side-by-side -side, um, program table summarizing those programs featured uh, during today's webinar, and that can be downloaded from ISAP's website at the link provided on this slide. A recording of February's webinar and the program summary matrix developed for those entities can be found there as well. Uh, and this link will also be included in the follow-up email provided on Friday. Next slide, please. So along with that resource, there are also several tools and reports featured uh, that we developed. And they can serve as a great starting point for anyone interested in digging deeper into quantifying outcomes of conservation practice implementation. Uh, that resource list is not intended to be exhausted or comprehensive, but is a great starting point. Um, and additionally, we just want to put on everyone's radar that we're working to compile all the responses and summary tables from the webinar series alongside with key decision support criteria and important considerations in a succinct resource document. Uh, we're aiming for five to ten pages, so trying to keep it pretty pretty succinct, and we're anticipating developing slide decks for shared use by our conservation partners as well. Um, so I encourage anyone interested in contributing to these efforts to please contact Jean or myself so we can be as inclusive as possible um, and sharing a common message around these opportunities and practices. Next slide, please. So as we mentioned, uh, to get a feel for some of these varying approaches, we did ask today's presenters to walk us through a hypothetical farmer scenario as part of their presentations. Uh, generally speaking, this is a pretty typical uh, scenario for a Midwest corn and soybean operation. Uh, we're assuming that the farmer operates a, a total of a thousand acres, owning half and renting half. Uh, they typically run two tillage passes ahead of corn and no-till their soybeans. Uh, three years ago, they began experimenting with cover crops on 80 acres, using that same field to try out oats and radishes before corn and then cereal rye before beans. Uh, so they're now considering an ecosystem market uh, with future plans listed on this slide. So in 2021, they anticipate implementing 420 additional acres of cereal rye ahead of beans, which would be on all of their owned acres. In 2022, they plan to go to no-till corn on all 1,000 acres um, and continuing cover crops on all of their own ground. And then in 2023, they'll bring cover crops to their rented ground, so adding an additional 500 acres of cereal rye ahead of no-till beans. Next slide, please. So this is just another um, representation of that same farmer scenario, this time just highlighting the new practices in green and yellow, according to the rented and owned ground um, and year of implementation. So as I mentioned, we've asked the presenters to incorporate this scenario in today's presentation, and I'm really excited to see how these different programs compare. Um, so just noting here that each presenter will get 12 minutes and we'll save Q&A for the last half of the webinar. So with that, thanks again for your time and let's get started. Back to you, Jean. Thanks, Emily. Um, great overview and setup of the uh, hypothetical farmer scenario. And um, we'll be kind of using that as a tool to compare the different programs. Um, and our first presenter will, uh, will be Lisa Streck. Uh, Lisa is the carbon business model grower lead for Bayer Crop Science where she's responsible for grower acquisition and ensuring a positive grower experience in Bayer's carbon program. Lisa has been with Bayer for over 20 years and has held roles of increasing responsibility in supply chain and product management. She is a graduate of the University of Missouri Columbia with a degree in agricultural economics and holds an MBA from Williams Wood University. She grew up on a family farm in central Missouri and outside of work, Lisa enjoys traveling, spending time with family, reading, and hiking. Thanks, Lisa, for joining us today. Oh, I think you're muted, Lisa. I can't hear you now. 
Perfect. I think I was muted by the organizer, so we're good to go um, getting through those technical glitches here, um, the benefits of being first. But um, thank you, Jean, and good morning to everyone on the phone this morning. Really appreciate the time to be with you here today um, and excited about this session today. And just want to echo some of the comments made in the, the first um, portion. I think it's great to have all of these educational opportunities for farmers to evaluate the different carbon programs that are in the marketplace and give them the information that they need to make the decision that's right for them. Um, so next slide, please. So when we structured the Bayer Carbon Program, we kept a few things were key for us. We really tried to keep the farmer at the center of our program because we, knew, we know if programs are gonna scale and be successful, it has to be able to work for the farmer, um, has to be easy for them, has to be simple, has to provide certainty. So we really used those pillars as we developed our program offering and can you continue to evolve our offering. As part of our process and to build our carbon program, we've got a year experience of our pilot program that we launched in 2020. So we incorporated the feedback from those growers who participated in the pilot program. We've also established a carbon advisory panel that has growers across the Midwest who are guiding us throughout the process. Um, it's been a great opportunity for us to bring some ideas to that group and then incorporate their feedback as we design and evolve our program. But through those different settings with farmers and then with additional market research that we've done, what was really highlighted to us of what's important for farmers in carbon programs is simplicity, flexibility, and certainty. And you'll see those key, those three key themes woven throughout how we've structured our program and how we'll execute on our program. So for a grower to participate in our program, um, they must have a climate field view account and be able to share those fields with us. So growers simply enroll in our program, share the fields that they want to enroll in the program, select those fields, and then what practices they have either adopted or plan to adopt on their farm. So that gives added flexibility where it's a field by field basis and then different, um, different practices can be incorporated on a field by field basis. And then Bayer also provides support to growers as they make this transition to incorporating the climate smart practices where you'll have access to our agronomy team to really help you implement these different practices on your farm. And then once the grower is signed up in our program, we really take it from there with the verification and validation that needs to occur. There may be instances where we ask for additional data, um, but we will do that directly with the grower as needed. And then certainty is another key pillar that we identified that was important to farmers on how they'll be paid for these programs. So we've structured our program to pay on a per acre basis by practice. And we know far this is typically how farmers calculate their ROI. So we've tried to structure our payment with that certainty and simplicity so that farmers can do the things that they do best, which is grow a crop. And then Bayer takes it from there and registers that carbon credit. So we're working with a variety of different carbon registry, registries to then register those carbon credits um, that can potentially be used to help us um, meet our own internal sustainability commitments or be av made available for sale for those companies who are working to meet their sustainability commitments. So next slide, please. So how do you find out if your fields are um, eligible within the Bayer Carbon Program? So we've made two big enhancements to our 2021 enrollment period that I'm really excited about. So we've substantially expanded our state geography. So we've added an additional eight states to our geography this year. So we've got over, we've got right at 17 states that are eligible to participate in our program. We've got great coverage across the traditional Corn Belt. And then we've got opportunity for some, some of our Southern states and Eastern states to participate in the program. So a wide coverage opportunity within our program this year. 
And then also new to our program this year, those growers who have previously adopted some practices since 2012 would now be eligible to enroll in our program. So this is a big enhancement that we made compared to our pilot program and uh, a, a key way for those growers who have been earlier adopters of some of these practices to have an opportunity to participate in carbon markets. Um, we know that's key for growers who may have already adopted these practices. So if growers have adopted these practices since 2012, um, they would be eligible to enroll in our program and may even be eligible for a historical payment up to five years practices on those acres that they enroll in the program. And then if growers have not yet adopted these practices but plan to adopt practices um, after January 1st of 2021, they would be eligible to enroll in our program, obviously would not be eligible for a historical component but would be eligible to enroll in our program for 2021. Next slide, please. So what makes us different? Um, so I talked about this a little bit in the beginning on really those three pillars that we've put in place as, as we've structured our program. It's that certainty for growers, the simplicity and flexibility, and then the opportunity to, to share in the upside as we know that carbon markets continue to to evolve. So how do we provide certainty? Certainty is the amount of payments that growers will receive on a per acre basis per practice. So after verification and validation, growers can count on that payment for implementing the practices on their farm. And then simplicity and flexibility with our program. So with our structure, there are no additional costs. Um, they are handling all the soil sampling, all the verification and validation that must be done as part of the program. So no hidden cost um, that would potentially be coming back to the growers. Um, an easy enrollment process, um, we're finding out that growers are enrolling their fields in as few as 15 minutes to go through the enrollment process. So a simple enrollment process that provides the flexibility that growers can select the fields that they want to enroll and then the practices that they plan to implement on their farm. And then an opportunity to share in the upside. So we know that carbon markets continue to, to develop. Uh, we expect to see the price of carbon credits to continue to increase. And as we see the price of carbon increase within the marketplace, we'll continue to evaluate that offer to the grower and really give the grower an opportunity to share in that upside. So great opportunity there to continue to take advantage of a developing carbon credit market. Next slide, please. So as the team did a great job identifying different farmer scenarios for, for us to look at, just a reminder of those different scenarios uh, where the two key components here are a rented land scenario and then an own land scenario and then the implementation of different practices from a timeline basis. So as we took this scenario back and evaluated it against the components of our program, next slide please. This is the opportunity um, that a grower would have to, to participate um, in our carbon program and what the expected revenue to be. So a couple key things that I wanna call out here is um, growers have an opportunity to have both rented and owned land to participate in our program. On rented land, we ask that growers do receive a signature from landowner as a one-time requirement for the program. So an opportunity for both rented and owned lands to participate in the program. And then as it broke out across the different fields and the timing of when practices were implemented. So on that rented land, that 500 acres where the grower um, initially started no-till, um, they would receive $3 an acre for their no-till acres each year. And then in year two, where the grower decides to incorporate cover crop, that would add an extra $6 an acre. So the revenue opportunity for that grower would then be $9 an acre for both the no-till and strip-till on, on that 500 acre field. 
Um, and if you look at that across the terms of the contract, that would be an opportunity to earn just under $40,000. And then on the owned acres within the program, the grower is practicing new till and cover crops. So that would be a total of $9 for each of those acres that would participate into the program. And then on the owned 80 acre field, um, the grower had implemented cover crop for the past two years. So there would be an opportunity to receive that past payment and the payment on future cover crop at the $6 an acre. And then the addition of the $3 an acre for the no-till, which would put the opportunity um, just under $9,000. So if you look at these three fields across the 10-year payment term of our contract, um, slightly over $85,000 earning opportunity for these fields to participate in the program, which on average would be right at $8,500 for each year of the program. Another key call out is these payments are guaranteed um, if farmer completes the practice. Um, so not dependent on the amount of carbon that is sequestered, which we've seen a wide range in the amount of carbon that can be sequestered, which is really dependent on field or on soil type and on environment. So it was important for us to ensure that growers had the certainty to know on what is the revenue that they can count on for participating in a carbon program. And within our program, there is an opportunity for those practices that were implemented after 2012 to potentially receive that historic payment up to five years. And then wanted to specifically call out both rented and owned lands have an opportunity to participate in the Bayer Carbon Program and that the grower would have to receive that signature from landowner, a one-time requirement um, to participate in the program. So overall, um, you know, de definitely an opportunity for, for added revenue stream for the grower to, to have fields participate in our program. Uh, in total, about $90,000 across the terms of the contract to participate in the program. And if you broke that down year by year, it would be about $8,500 a year for participating in the Bayer Carbon Program, given this farmer scenario. So with that, I am going to turn it back over to Jean. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I appreciate that information and um, we'll pass it now or set up, uh, introduce our next presenter, Emma Fuller. Emma is the uh, Director of Sustainability Science at Granular, a Corteva agri-science company. Uh, Emma is responsible for developing digital tools that use data-driven insights to support land stewardship, increase regenerative farming practices, and reward farmers for outcome-based results. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, lingo in there a little bit, Emma, I felt, <laughs> but uh, I know you're gonna break it down for us, that's great. Um, some of Emma's recent focus has really been on nitrogen efficiency tools and scalable carbon sequestration solutions for farmers and landowners. Um, Emma received her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from Princeton and lives on Vashon Island in Washington with her husband and young son, where they have a small family farm and grow produce for local markets and restaurants. So I appreciate you joining us today, Emma. Just do a quick, All right. All right. We can I think I'm great. unmuted now. Yeah, great. Awesome. Thank you for having me. In, and I'm really excited to be able to walk through um, these next couple of slides. So if you go to the next slide. So at the highest level overview, the Corteva Carbon Initiative is broadly offering about five to twenty dollars an acre um, by you either introducing cover crops or switching to strip till or no till for this growing season. The way the program works is that you will sell your credits to Corteva for a guaranteed $15 a ton, and we'll provide all the software for the record keeping, do soil sampling, and line up buyers for those credits. The real focus of this from day one has been um, making this simple and transparent for farms and really focusing on the outcomes of what you're generating so that those can be sold as really high quality rigorous credits to the marketplace so that you can get the top dollar um, for the value that you're providing. I'll go to the next slide. 
So that's a lot of high level jargon. So let's break it down and walk through each one of these steps. For each one of these, we're gonna go through the eligibility, what you stand to gain, then of course, importantly, what are you committing to, um, how you might sign up for this, and then sort of a, a brief closer on exactly what we see as the value of our program. And we're gonna sort of uh, use that uh, farm scenario to illustrate some of this. So you can go to the next slide. So first, are your fields eligible? Go to the next slide, please. This is for our pilot program this year. So you have to have, as I mentioned, uh, either introduced cover crops uh, in the fall of 2020, or you switched to strip or no-till um, this year. And you need to farm corn, and, uh, corn or soybeans, and you need to be in Iowa, Illinois, or Indiana. So this is our first year with this. We will expect to see both uh, increases in geographies and crops going into 22, but this is our core eligibility. So if we go to the next slide, we can apply that to the farm scenario. So trying to break down that farm scenario a little bit, we have sort of three buckets of acres. You have those 420 owned acres um, that adopted cover crops last fall. You have the 80 acres that will adopt, have been doing cover crops for some time, but will adopt no-till and corn next year. And then those 500 rented acres that will also adopt corn, uh, no-till corn in the following year. So if you apply our eligibility criteria to the scenario, what you find, if you go to the next slide, is that the 420 are, are uh, eligible to enroll today. And if you go to the next slide, both the 80 acres and the 500 acres will be eligible in 22 when they adopt those new practices. So the key here really is that you have to adopt new practices at the field level. And this is really because this is what we find from buyers in this marketplace, that we're, we're somewhat stuck between being able to offer credits that buyers will actually purchase. And so while we're really focused on trying to identify solutions for those early adopters, we didn't wanna hold back on this opportunity to offer to farms today, um, where we think that they can get value in the current marketplace. So the next very important question, yes, you're eligible. Is it even worth your time? So in terms of what you stand to gain, our program to remind you is $15 a ton um, for carbon. So if we work through this 420 owned acres that are eligible today, go to the next slide. The way that you would calculate this is the total number of acres, times the carbon that you expect to sequester times the price that we're offering, which will give you the total dollars for this field for a single year. So if you go to the next slide, we can plug in some numbers here. So we have 420 acres. We're gonna say roughly half a ton of acre uh, carbon per acre per year. And this is uh, from Comet Planner, which is one of the tools that uh, was introduced in this, the introduction. Um, so you can plug in practices and acres and geography and sort of see how those rates might vary. And then multiplied by 15, which is the price that we're guaranteeing. So that would be a little over $3,000 for this field for this year. And so you would multiply that times the contract length in order to get your total 10 year, your total contract termed payout, which should lead you to the question, okay, what is it actually, what am I committing to? How long data privacy, all of that really important stuff. So we go to the next slide. The, I think the key buckets here, right, are what's the contract, what does the contract say and what, how is your data protected and what privacy do you have? So the contract is a 10 year contract, um, but you have an ability to opt out at two years. That's because ESMC, the sort of third party that we're working with to validate and verify these credits is in pilot phase for the next two years, and then we'll go to full market launch in two years. And so we wanna make sure that farms have the opportunity to evaluate that at full market launch and make a decision whether or not they wanna continue. And you have this ability uniquely within ESMC to be able to switch among the 60 plus other companies that are a part of that marketplace. Um, so you have a lot of flexibility, even though you're committing um, to our program. In terms of data and privacy, You'll use granular insights to log your practices. So enroll your field boundaries and report on any practices that, and, that you do. And that means that your data is protected both by granular's data privacy policy, which means that the data is your own and you need to give us explicit permission to be able to share this data with anyone else. And then ESMC also has a very stringent um, privacy policy so that your data will only be used to quantify carbon outcomes and they will not share that data themselves with any other third parties. So buyers will not see this. Um, and, and so you need to give explicit permission on each of those steps. So you are in full control of your data. What we see with this program is hopefully a, a 10 year revenue stream um, that's got the flexibility of ESMC, but is backed up um, by Cortevas. And um, so the, the risk is held with us. You go to the next slide. 
So if you're interested, this is how you sign up. You would go to corteva.com slash carbon and you can enter in your information um, and a carbon, Corteva Carbon Expert will reach out to you. And so we really have these carbon experts that are focused on walking you through this process and making it super simple and super transparent. So similar to the scenario that I just walked through um, in this webinar, they can work, walk through your specific operation and break it down for you of here's what you're committing to, here's what you stand to gain, here's all the, the details that you would need field by field. Um, and you can email them directly at carbon at corteva.com. And also, if you have a Pioneer or Corteva rep, you can reach out to them to talk more about this program. Or if you're in central Indiana, we're partnering with Nutrien to offer this program through Nutrien reps. So if that's your advisor of choice, you're totally welcome to approach them to ask more questions and get connected. And go to the final slide. So overall, again, we're really focused on trying to make this transparent, make it straightforward, relatively simple. Um, and really give you flexibility, right? So what fields make sense to you? What practices make sense to you for your fields? And we really encourage folks whenever they're starting to think about these programs to look really carefully at all of our all of these different programs, right? This may not be the right program for you and that's fine. Um, it's really important we think to pro choose the right program um, for your operation. So what we think is nice about our program is that we give you certified credits, no vesting schedule, so you get paid on those outcomes right away. Um, these are marketable credits that will be certified by ESMC, a third party NGO that is uh, funded in part by the USDA, and you'll, your data will be secure and protected under our privacy policies. We're really focused on keeping this simple and straightforward for folks. Uh, we'll run soil samples for you at no cost in order to get that highest quality credit, uh, and you'll have the full support of a dedicated Corteva carbon expert. Finally, you'll also use Granular Insights to track your information. And Granular Insights is a free software, uh, farm management software that you could sign up for today to take a, take a look at it. And so the benefit there, right, is that your data that you're submitting for carbon will be useful for getting carbon credits, but will also be useful for making all the, supporting all the other agronomic decisions that you make day to day on your farm. Finally, uh, we're really focused on flexibility. Um, you're committing to two years with no upfront fees and you'll get to choose the practices that make sense to you. And so after those two years, you can continue to stay with Corteva or choose another buyer in ESMC if you think um, there are better terms out there. And maybe a last point is I think what we expect to see both, maybe we'll touch on this a little bit in Q&A, is we expect to see um, these prices rise. And so we're really committed to having at least 75% of the uh, carbon price increases go directly to the farm. Um, and right now in our pilot phase, we're seeing more than 75% of the price of carbon go directly to the farmer um, to support these outcomes. And with that, I will hand it back to you, Jean. Thanks, Anna. Point. There are questions. Sorry, I forgot about the slide. So Corteva Carbon, and then we're happy to get questions, not just from farmers, but agronomists and retailers and conservation professionals to share a little bit more and go through the details. Okay, now back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Great. Um, yeah, our third presenter today is Sally Fliss, the Sustainable Ag Field Manager with Nutrient Ag Solutions. Sally is responsible for engaging Nutrient Ag Solution retail business with sustainability initiatives across the United States. She joined, she's a relatively uh, relative newcomer to Nutrient Ag Solutions, having joined just in January, um, has been working with growers and crop consultants across the U.S. Uh, for implementing sustainability programs around carbon emissions, carbon sequestration, and improved crop production efficiency. Um, but uh, she's not necessarily a newcomer to this field. Um, prior to working with Nutrient Egg Solutions, Sally was the Senior Director of Agronomy at the Fertilizer Institute and has worked on the expansion of 4R nutrient stewardship programs uh, through Farm Bill. So Sally is passionate about agriculture sustainability and economic sustainability of growers in the United States. And I appreciate you uh, being with us today, Sally. Thanks, Jean. So, uh, we're looking at our different ecosystem pilots. We've got a slightly different approach to the markets and the pilots that we're conducting this year than a couple of the other programs that are out there. So next slide, please. So we really approach this whole challenge through a portfolio program where we're building on the collaboration and trust of our other supply chain partners, our downstream manufacturers and processors and other partners in our growers and our crop consultants in the field. So we've got our Nutrient Ag Solutions Sustainability Team, the crop consultants on the ground that are working directly with 
the growers, the growers we work with, those downstream partners uh, that are sometimes our co-buyers with us in a couple of these pilots, uh, and then our strategic other uh, supplier partners like Corteva, who we're helping out with on that uh, ESMC pilot in Indiana, and uh, looking at other third-party service providers that we can incorporate into the pilots. Next slide, please. So our approach to sustainability is really trying to help growers and our crop consultants on the ground think about sustainability for the whole year on that acre. So all the different parts and pieces, whether it's the measurement, seed selection, uh, herbicide and pesticide use, other biocatalysts or cover crops or additional conservation practices so that we can drive the yield quality, overall input efficiency, and then how can we also add to that system uh, that extra value of those environmental values, whether it's through carbon, greenhouse gas emission reductions, water quality credits, traceability, other environmental or sustainability demands along the supply chain. Next slide, please. So where do we sit with our carbon pilot efforts? we're playing a little bit across um, all the different opportunities that are out there. So I think this was covered in some of the earlier sessions that were hosted by um, this group, but we're working in the offset side of things on those scope one uh, type credits that are really that uh, outside buyer group, airlines, that kind of thing that are looking for those scope one credits to offset their emissions that they have control of. And we have a project that's in 14 different states in Canada, but going all the way from uh, New York to Montana, covering about 200,000 acres, where we're looking at all the different possibilities of how to generate those scope one credits. So we're looking at the different um, additionality, the different permanence requirements of the different registries out there where we can generate those scope one credits. We're also functioning under the scope three um, part of things, partially with a couple of our ESMC pilots with Corteva and Syngenta. And we're also working on um, pilots with the Soil and Water Outcomes Fund. And those pilots looking at scope three are in Ohio uh, in five different states, covering about 60,000 acres. And so there we're really looking at that link of the crop produced and changing that emission factor related to the crop produced or the emission factor related to the fertilizer sold because as a large producer of fertilizer we also have a pretty large emissions footprint to think about ourselves. Next slide. Uh, we feel like we've got a pretty unique approach to this because we've got that direct grower contact as one of the largest ag retailers in the United States uh, to build on that trusted advisor relationship that we have with growers and work on that full acre approach uh, to help improve the return on investment overall while adding to that return on investment the opportunity to be invested in or participate in these other market opportunities. We provide that year-round agronomic support to these growers. We're able to help implement the um, technology side and custom fertilizer blending for our principals on the ground. Uh, in addition to the data collection opportunities and our soil and tissue testing uh, abilities through the Waypoint Labs, and then working to try and figure out what is the best place to help growers place those credits as we generate them to find the best buyers and best value for the grow. Next slide, please. So this is a little bit of how we're approaching the different practice implementation across the different pilots. So we're trying to focus on a couple of different areas of opportunity for growers. I think the one thing that's different in our pilots versus the previous two programs is we are trying to uh, figure out how can we also get at that nitrogen management credit. So how we reduce nitrous oxide emissions around those fertilizer management practices or for our practices how can we take advantage of those credits in addition to those soil management or soil sequestration uh, credits as well? And so we've got um, different fertilizer management practices in addition to the new no-till and cover cropping practices that we're looking at in our pilots. Next slide, please. Uh, we can actually, well, 
this just remind everybody what uh, the scenario was that we were provided to take a look at so we can skip right to the next slide. So since we're looking at scope one and scope three credits a little kind of separate um, on the same acres that we've got enrolled or across the different pilots that we're implementing, I try, I broke my table down by which acres would fit into a scope one versus a scope three project. It, overall, the answer is that all these acres, um, other than that 80 acres that was previously in cover crops would fit into one of our, our different uh, categories one of our pilots across the board. So there's opportunity. And again, if we're looking at scope one, we've got that need for the owner agreements because you get into the longer permanence agreements around that relationship of those scope one credits really being tied to the piece of property versus the scope three credits really being tied to the plot of the product produced. And so it's on a little more of an annual basis. So we're still discovering a bit about what those landowner needs are on our scope three side versus the scope one side. Um, but overall opportunities across the board for growers to engage in one of our, in, for this grower to engage in one of our pilots, depending on what their overall goals are. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned, the other piece that we're working on is the improved nitrogen management for reduced emissions credits. And so this is using the Climate Action Reserve Nitrogen Management Project Protocol. And here we're looking at, uh, this is an annual sign up. The additionality requirements, so that new practice piece is a little bit different here than it is for the no-till or cover crop. It's actually tied to a rate reduction, though not a huge rate reduction. It's a 5% reduction in that synthetic nitrogen rate from a field uh, where we establish a baseline looking at either past crop production or uh, local statistics on nitrogen used rates. Um, there's no soil testing involved in this piece. It's really all just modeled out based on rate, uh, location, and the uh, crop grown and crop yield as to what the reduction in emissions would be. It's not as many tons per acre as we see in the sequester, uh, sequestration realm. So we're only looking at that 0.02 to 0.1 tons per acre of uh, carbon equivalents in these programs, but it is an annual sign up and the additionality requirements are a little bit different and so can offer some opportunities to growers that might not be able to participate because they've been in some really long-term no-till or cover crop situations to at least start to examine and figure out how these markets and agreements function. Uh, next slide. Uh, I mentioned we've got partnerships to help us reach all these acres. So in the 200,000 pilot acres that I, well, 260,000 pilot acres I mentioned earlier, these are the partners we're working with. We do have American Farmland Trust as part of one of our projects with Soil and Water Outcomes Fund in Ohio, working with BASF in um, Chesapeake Bay area, Corteva in Indiana, Ingredion in PepsiCo and one of our Illinois pilots, Maple Leaf Foods, which is a, um, uh, downstream partner that we're working with in Canada on one of our scope three pilots, and then Syngenta on an additional ESMC pilot. So we really cast a broad net of partners and pilots to try and figure out what are the best fits for growers as we look at these different opportunities and programs across the landscape. And I think that's it. Thanks, Sally. I appreciate that information um, and uh, we have left uh, ample time for questions here um, and see a lot of good questions coming in through the uh, question bar there. So um, <clears throat> we're going to use the remaining time and just kind of use like a round table of uh, response. Um, I'll pose a question and then the presenters will have the opportunity to respond. So. Um, Maybe just invite uh, Emma and Lisa to turn their cameras back on and I'll share a few ground rules here where um, we've, we've mentioned this to everybody already, but just uh, reiterate it. Um, everybody will be, I'll ask a question and everybody will have an opportunity, uh, one minute to respond to that question. Um, 
if if you're really really wordy i'll i'll probably cut you off but uh, so far you've all been really great in um sticking to our suggested times and um then we'll go to the next uh person to respond and i'll rotate through the same order as you presented so lisa you uh, first question will go to you and then Emma and Sally and then I'll rotate through that order as well so that everybody has an opportunity to go first. So um, I think our first question actually um, has come in, there's, there's lots of questions about existing practices and I think it's really exciting and encouraging that many of your programs are actually able to engage with farmers who have been doing practices for multiple years. Um, but a question that came up through the audience participation uh, during this is that how do the registries, um, whether it's VERA or gold standard, how do they actually verify the carbon generated from those historical practices? And um, so this one, I think, uh, Lisa, um, and, and if, if your program isn't really playing in the space of historical practices, that's, you know, you can just pass or move on. Yeah, so I can, I'll kick us off here, Jean. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay. I think we're unmuted. So, um, so that is one of the enhancements that we've made for our program for uh, enrollment this year is those growers who have implemented these practices since 2012 would now be eligible to enroll in our program and even may be eligible for payment up to five years on those past practices. Um, so we're working individually with the different registries to understand the data that we need to capture to, um, number one, show when the timeline of when these practices were implemented, and then um, any additional information that the registries would need. So we're able to go back um, several years and capture some of that satellite imagery to understand when practices were implemented, and then we'll work with the growers on an individual basis um, and collect that information that the registries may be requiring. Great. Emma? Yeah, so as I mentioned in our current pilot, we're not letting, practices changes have to be this last year. So we're not doing look back. That said, I can offer, we're also pretty familiar with this process, so I can give you a really high sketch of what that looks like, um, which is often they'll take soil samples today and then they'll model back what you did. So they require all the practices that you did for the years that you want credit. And they'll also want practice information for the time before you beat those practice changes. So if you're looking several years back, you'll need several more years of data before that to set what's called a baseline, because there's no way to go sadly back in time and grab that soil sample that you would need. So this can mean, more data, and we have experience with this from our 2019 pilot with Nori. Um, so Nori also let, a, let there be a five-year look back so that you would collect all that data. The models can work reasonably well that way. And one of the reasons we would love to do look backs, um, but we are really not able to, to find buyers for those credits right now. And so the moment that that changes in this marketplace, we will be really excited to offer that sort of look back. But today we're really focused on what we can sell on to third parties um, and translate that value back. So I'll pass it on to Sally. Thanks, Emma and Lisa. So we are not doing any look back credits in ours, uh, similar response to what Emma had said around um, why we're not doing it. We're really just focusing on the new practice uh, implementation and looking to how can we use things like the NMPP, the Nitrogen Management Protocol, as a way to engage those growers that are further along in their practice implementation. So Lisa, so a follow-up for you, if I'm understanding right, then there is this there is this look back opportunity where farmers can be compensated. So who's actually buying those credits then? So we continue to be in conversations with different companies um, looking for for opportunities to be able to market those credits. Um, and you know, as Bayer's operating on in this space, we're taking on some, some risk here um, to do this, but we think it's important for those growers who have adopted some of these practices since 2012 to have an opportunity to participate. Um, so we're, we're taking a risk here in, in this area to, to develop the marketplace, and we're continuing to have conversations with a wide array of potential buyers um, looking for, for those who would be willing to purchase those credits. Thanks for clarifying. Um, I think an, another common scenario, you know, so so maybe farmers have been 
trying trying these practices. Um, some of them have been using them fully. And and I think you know one one common thing is uh, for a farmer to enroll in a farm bill type program. You know through NRCS or maybe it's a state funded conservation program um, that compensates them for practices like cover crops and reduced tillage. So if a farmer is enrolled in a farm bill program, are those acres still eligible to be enrolled in your program? And uh, for this question, we'll start with Emma. Trying to get off mute there. Um, short answer is yes. So we recognize today that the payments that you're seeing for carbon programs don't come anywhere near paying for the full cost of adopting these practices, right? So if you're getting somewhere between five and $20 an acre, um, from our program, we know cover crop seed alone can can go much more than that, let alone the actual seeding event and the termination event. So we think that this layering of different sources of value is crucial. Um, so yes, like definitely you can sign up for those cost share programs. And in fact, we're partnering with a startup called FarmRaise, um, who is really focused on trying to streamline that process of applying to the NRCS. Because we, we also hear a lot from our farms that it's a lot of work paperwork wise to do all of that even though there's like there's money on the line. Um, and so we're really trying to address that through partnerships in this space. And so if you sign up um, on our website for our carbon thing, we can get you connected also to farm raise. Even if you decide not to go with our carbon program, you can still work with farm raise. There's no connection there, but we wanted to make that opportunity like front and center so that you can do that kind of layering. Sally, how about you? Yeah, so I'm going to give my favorite agronomist answer. It depends on which pilot you're involved in, how that plays in. So some of them, like the ESMC ones, it doesn't matter. Um, a couple of the different registries have, it's not that you can't have it, it's really around the timing of when you made the practice change versus when you signed that NRCS contract. So we're really just trying to sort through that piece um, of which registries or programs require or allow different types of funding to be involved in the process. Lisa? And I'm gonna have a similar response to, to Sally where it really depends on what the goals are of these different programs, right? So I would definitely encourage growers to check out the eligibility requirements of different programs if they're looking for an opportunity to, to stack, right? So the Bayer program, you know, the goal of that is to reduce greenhouse gases. So it's one greenhouse gas program per acre. So depending on what the eligibility requirements are of these other programs and what they're trying to accomplish, it would depend on those if you could layer, um, but definitely agree with Emma. Um, encourage growers to look for opportunities to, to layer because we know that these programs alone sometimes don't cover the cost, but uh, definitely dig into the details and understand what the eligibility requirements are of different programs. So, so just kind of a follow-up, again, a clarifying question on this that came in from the audience is um, whether your contracts claim all the potential ecosystem service credits, for example, habitat or water quality, or whether you're just looking at carbon. So um, I think we'll just stick with the same order and we'll have Emma respond to this one first. Yeah. Um, Today, you're just getting paid on your greenhouse gas emissions for this market. And my gosh, we are so excited about the water quality um, and habitat co-benefits. I think that's one of the strongest arguments for you know, the great part of the solution that farmland can play in, in climate change is that it addresses greenhouse gas emissions, but it has a tremendous amount of co-benefits that a lot of other direct air capture does not. That said, the market is slower to develop for water quality credits in terms of the buyers showing up and even slower still on biodiversity. As an ecologist, like I am personally extremely excited to be able to quantify and offer those benefits. And actually Bayer has done a really nice job with their um, alternative management practices program that they run with Pheasants Forever. So I think there are some other programs out there to think about those co-benefits. Um, again, you can chat with our carbon specialists if you wanna get into the weeds on that on opportunities, but we don't have a systematic scalable program today, but we're really keen to find those opportunities. So if there are folks on the phone that have ideas or see opportunity in that space, we're really excited to bring those to our growers. How about uh, Nutrien? So on all of our pilots, we are doing soil organic carbon and emission reduction credits, but on a few of our pilots, three of them, 
uh, we are also looking at the water quality credits because we were able to come up with some water quality buyers and very specific watersheds. I think to follow on Emma's challenge there of finding buyers for water qualities, it's really got to be in the right watershed because there's some watersheds that just don't need those credits as way as other the way other watersheds do. So um, beyond that, we have not looked at any other credits on the larger ecosystem scale. And similar comments from, from me as well within the Bayer program, right? Our, how the contract is structured is greenhouse gas reductions today, but believe that we've got a huge opportunity in agriculture today to be a nature-based solution on the, to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases, how quick we could potentially scale. And then you just think about the huge opportunity to layer these other practices on top of it. Um, I think we'll continue to see these programs expand um, into the future. And I, I'm really excited about what those opportunities could, could bring for um, you know, farmers, for the industry as a whole. I think we've got a huge opportunity in front of us. So I think um, while none of you said this, I think my my advice would be, you know, to make sure that the farmers are reading their contracts. And so if there is water quality credits that come online, uh, making sure who owns that that potential in the future, just recognizing that that it is a new area and there's a lot of interest in, in it um, through water quality or biodiversity co-benefits. So read the fine print. Um, and speaking of fine print, Emma, you set us up for this question perfectly, uh, talking about some, some streamlining and partnerships to reduce paperwork because paperwork can be a real challenge for everybody. Um, and, and I've heard from farmers that, you know, the high level of data and detailed records keeping can, uh, can be a real um, barrier to, to participating. So, uh, Sally, you're first on this question. Um, how often does a producer need to report management practices and, and what system is in place to make it as easy as possible for that farmer? Yeah, I think, unfortunately, there's not quite, at least on our pilots, we don't have a system that makes it easy as possible because we've got so many different levels of data qualification. So on our pilots where we're looking at soil organic carbon, we're going back five years of historical data plus five years looking forward with those growers. We're currently only in a one year agreement with them. So we're really waiting to decide which registry or if we're going to go to a registry or how that all looks before we do a longer term agreement. And we're just in the process of going out to collect that data. That data will all be stored in our Agrable platform. Um, that's gonna be where we build out all of our sustainability projects. In all of them, there'll be a need for annual reporting because we're gonna to need to go out and re-verify that yield and what practices actually occurred. Did they plant the crops they meant they intended to, to plant? So even though we have that five years looking forward, we're going to want to go out and confirm what actually happened in that field as we look to those future years of uh, credit generation. So it'll be at least an annual touch with the biggest lift being in that first year if the grower has the opportunity to do a soil organic carbon credit. In just the nitrogen emission reduction piece, it's um, can be about a three year look back depending on how they decide to set their nitrogen baseline. And then it's just one crop rotation forward, maybe two crop rotations forward. So that forward looking data depends on um, how many different crops they crop in that crop rotation. How about you, Lisa? So on on the within the Bayer program, and I mentioned this earlier in the presentation, we're utilizing climate field view to share field boundaries with us. And then through the enrollment process, the grower creates an account in what we call our digital marketplace. Um, so through that digital marketplace is where grower indicates, um, you know, what practices they plan to implement, when they implement it. And then throughout our verification and validation process, we expect that we'll ask the grower for additional information. And then they will share that information with us um, either through the, the digital marketplace or a potential website um, upload to um, ensure that we're collecting that information um, and able to provide it to the registries on a, on a timely basis. Thanks. Emma? Yeah, um, so similar to the other two folks, you will submit data annually. 
um, for that sort of cadence. So every year your carbon is quantified. And so every year you need that data to run that quantification. Um, this is where we really are focusing on our carbon support uh, and our carbon advisor folks that will help you walk through that process um, because it can be overwhelming to make sure that you've got the data in and it's all um, correctly entered. Um, You'll submit through using granular insights. And so we find that to be a pretty efficient way to get this data in and then also have it be useful for a lot of other things. Just like carbon is a layer of value alongside cost share, alongside all these other sources, we also hope that the data you collect is valuable beyond carbon, right? So for your nitrogen applications, for your choice of crops, for comparing yields, all that sort of stuff. So again, encourage folks to look at granular insights so that you can get a sense of that without having to commit to any programs or any sort of contracts to really get a sense of what that data is valuable for and how it would be entered it'll all be in there um and I, for in terms of specifics when you sign up for corteva carbon we need three years of some historical data so we need three years of yields and crop type um and nitrogen applications <laughs> if you are on rented ground and you don't know say what happened three years ago which is totally plausible um we can work with you to set up reasonable defaults in that case so that you can still be able to be qualified Great. So um, <clears throat> just remind the audience to, um, you know, keep adding your questions here as we go. And um, also to refer to the program matrix um, that uh, is available on the ISAP website, because some of the basic questions that are coming in, um, they'll be available or they're answered on the program matrix. So um, a lot of that information that we're teasing out here is summarized very succinctly on that matrix. Um, and uh, you know we really created that matrix to try to to try to really make information make this whole very complex marketplace understandable uh, to farmers. And and another thing, as Emily mentioned in her introduction, you know we also created this hypothetical farmer scenario as a way to really uh, build in some touch points uh, for these programs. Um, we met with all of you individually, and all of you were like, "Ooh, that hypothetical farmer scenario doesn't really." fit or our program doesn't fit 100% with those scenarios, right? And there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of um, kind of complexity or variables there. So anyway, I just, I just set that all up because we recognize even though that scenario was developed to try to capture kind of a typical Midwest farmer, it left out a whole suite of conditions that are common in Midwest agriculture and in other parts of the country as well. So um, starting with first of all that it was a pretty corn and soybean centric centric scenario so i'd like each of you to just talk about opportunities for livestock farms you know maybe managed with uh, rotational grazing or managed grazing um, silvopasture and even how manure management um, touches on your program or how your program interacts with that if it does and i think we're back to lisa with the first response for this one yeah, th thanks, Jean. And, and you're right. Currently, our um, program is for corn, soy, and then potentially with a wheat rotation. We we are looking at opportunities to expand to other crops. Um, we have not yet brought in um, livestock or grazing, but continue to look for opportunities as well there. That just brings another level of complexity on the amount of data that you would need to capture. How do you quantify those things? Uh, you know, we're committed to continue to evaluate those opportunities, as I spoke about before, to, to potentially layer in when we think about these programs. We're, we're just not there yet and trying to understand what data would registries need and then how we would capture those data. But our team of scientists continue to work behind the scenes to try to figure out how we could crack that code and then bring that opportunity to farmers. Emma? Yeah, like Lisa said, we're corn and soy focused for this year's pilot. Um, all I can say is without committing anything specific, stay tuned for more geographies and more crops. Um, based on sort of the large acreage crops and large acreage geographies, it's sort of not going to be a terrible surprise about where we go in terms of trying to hit the most farms um, to give the most access to these sorts of programs. So again, we'll have a little bit more similar to what Lisa said. Um, I think rangelands and pasturelands represent a huge opportunity. Um, and the science is a little bit further behind what croplands are. So we are also working really hard to see how we can make that those opportunities available to folks outside of just the corn soy rotations um, and look forward to being able to offer that very soon. How about you, Sally? 
Uh, so since we are really treating this year as learning and discovery in all of our pilots, we have everything from sweet potatoes to beef to dairy production involved in our pilots, recognizing that you know, the sweet potato production, we will probably not be able to get registry generated credits in that system, but we want to start looking at how does it look for a grower that's doing something other than that corn soy rotation. We've got a dairy, a couple of dairies working with us on those pilots as well, where we've got corn silage in the rotation, which is recognized a little bit, but has to be handled very differently. And those nutrient use efficiency numbers do not necessarily mean the same thing as when we're looking at a corn grain production. And then when we get further west, we have quite a few wheat acres. I think we ended up with a little bit of barley in there. Um, some of that will be able to go on to different registries. Some of that is really just trying to figure out how do those numbers come out differently? What are the different data? How does this all work as we look across that diverse grower customer base that we've got? Um, and of course, our West Coast and our Southeast growers keep wanting us to work on cotton and tree crops and nuts and oranges and everything under the sun. So we're trying to figure out how to how to find all that right data and what do environmental metrics mean for some of those crops that aren't quite as well researched. So, so again, maybe another area for farmers to really read the fine print in their contract to make sure that they're not limiting opportunities to, um, you know, take advantage of these incentives with other crops or other farm operations. Um, my, just my, my two cents plug in there. Um, uh, so then, okay, so the hypothetical farmer, we tried to put you all in a box, um, you know, farms vary from from the next and, and we know one year, even on a farm, one year can vary um, from from the one before the one coming down the in the future, you know, and sometimes really Mother Nature just messes with your plans and you can't get the practice implemented, you know, maybe it's cover crops or uh, tillage, you know, needs needs to be changed because of conditions in the field. So you sign a contract, you say you're going to do something, and in the end, you just physically cannot do it. Uh, could farmers find themselves in a situation where they have to return payments or make penalty payments? Um, and so, and then like, that's obvious kind of a yes or no, but really maybe talking more broadly about how your program adapts to real world challenges. And I th think we're on Emma for this one. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the short answer is no. Farms will not have any penalty payments and um, not find themselves in a situation where they owe Corteva or any other carbon program money. Not at all. Like we 100% understand that uh, you cannot control or even predict the weather. The way that these uh, carbon quantification models tend to work is to try to have what's called a dynamic baseline. So every year they're modeling what would have happened with your soils, with your weather, with your old practices. And what you're getting credit for is that difference between what your new practices are generating versus what your old practices are generating. So that takes that sort of weather variability into account. So if you have a bad year, it might have been even worse when your old practices, in which case you could still end up seeing a gain. Um, so that's, that's of course, if, if you were able to sequester carbon. There are definitely cases where you have a pest outbreak, you have really wet fields, right? There, like, there are realities and no one here thinks that carbon credits are enough that you should be farming for carbon first and crops second, right? Like your revenue generation potential totally comes from your crops and then you're trying to farm carbon on top of that. So we totally recognize that. And so there's no penalties whatsoever in our pilot program. When market launches, this is part of why we have that two-year opt-out, I think that we will start to see again buyers are sort of demanding we need some certainty on this. So I expect in two years that the landscape will have shifted a little bit. And again, that's why we want to make sure there's optionality for folks that are signing up today, that they have an ability to really take stock of the landscape in two years um, and make the decisions about how they want to proceed. Sally? Yeah, so currently we're all on one year agreements. We don't have, uh, well, some of our partner agreements are two years, uh, but none of our agreements are for more than this one year. And so really our approach at this point is we're just gonna spend a lot of time with these growers trying to see what they actually did and what practices actually went out on the ground and how that comes out um, and do that true up on an annual basis right now. We're still, as we decide which registry or how we're gonna um, where we're going to go as we generate these credits, we'll have a better idea of how that accounting system works. Um, 
but same as Emma, we're not going to be looking for payments back from a grower at any point. It would be covered in, you know, why did that practice not happen? Why did it was it a, a cropping decision on beyond your control, that act of God clause that we see in our insurance policies, right? Um, what was the reason it happened? And then uh, we're required by many of these registries to keep a buffer pool of our own. And so it doesn't necessarily go back to the grower, but us as the working on administering the program, we have to keep a pool of credits available for any of those reversals that happen, or we have to go out and find new acres to replace those reversals. So it wouldn't probably ever, it wouldn't ever come back to the grower. It would come back to us as that product, project administrator to figure out how to get around any of those reversals or practices that didn't get implemented. But again, we don't have anything in an agreement like that because we're still on this one-year agreement with growers right now. Sure. Lisa? Yeah, so so similar response um, from, from the Bayer side, no penalty to the grower if they can't implement the practice. Um, Obviously, we understand that nobody can predict mother nature and there may be instances for whatever reason that the grower was unable to um, adopt those practices. So no penalty within our program. And even within our contract, which is a 10 year term at any point within that term, if the grower decides that the program's not right for them and they no longer wanna participate, they can provide written notice to, to Bayer that they choose to leave the program and there's no penalty for leaving, no clawback on um, past payments that may have occurred. So um, we've structured our contract to give really that ultimate flexibility to, to growers to participate. And, and to Sally's comment, right, that some of the, the risk that you know, providers are taking on these carbon programs are these buffer pools and making sure that we're structuring our programs so that farmer ultimately benefits in, in these programs and we're taking a similar approach at Bayer as well. Good to know um, farmers are, are not being, uh, I think farming is difficult enough, right? So uh, risky enough, um, the risk is not being passed on to them. Um, um, this one, I think Sally's up. Um, what does the future of your program look like? And so I know, Sally, you're kind of in this early pilot stage, um, but, but you know, maybe specifically looking at the future of your program, kind of two thoughts are, um, are you expecting to add additional states and how do you determine those geographies? And, and then also where you see um, payment levels going, you know, are they expected to stay stable or expected to increase over time? Yeah, uh, I don't have a great answer to any of those questions, Jean. We do plan, I mean, our, our vision is really around that whole acre solution piece and optimizing productivity and yield and return on investment and managing that whole acre with the grower throughout the years. And hopefully being able to find the right opportunity for growers to engage in in these additional markets or other opportunities on top of that. Um, we really haven't got a solid decision on what our next round of pilots or programs will look like going forward. Price-wise, I don't know. It's hard to tell uh, where carbon prices are going to go. Uh, I think we've all got that vision that we're going to be selling credits to somebody like a Delta Airlines, but then Delta Airlines is asking the government to pay for their current carbon credits that they have sitting around. Uh, so I don't know. It's really hard to tell where that price is going to go, but I do know from my work with Nutrien and TFI and working with growers, there's return to growers on these practices, whether there's a carbon market available. Very true. Lisa? Yeah, and I mentioned some of this earlier that we're continuing to look at opportunities to expand crops that can participate in the program as well as geography and then in the future even the layering in of additional practices. Um, I think Sally made some really great comments that the carbon credit market is developing, right? Um, you can't really say we've got a market today. 
Um, but at Bayer, we're committed to passing down that value to growers um, within our program, really sharing that value of the carbon credit. So it's really in all of our best interest to see that value of carbon credits increase. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of variables in play today here, right? The um, the market is developing, lots of players. You know, what role will USDA, will Department of Ag play? Um, so, so we'll see how it develops, but, um, you know, I'm excited that, you know, we've got a program in place today um, to give an opportunity to connect growers to this future carbon market revenue stream. And, you know, at Bayer, given our footprint and the tools that we have available, we feel like it's our responsibility to play a role in connecting farmers to this potential market. And then overall, the role that the industry can play as a whole. I think we've got, uh, you know, a great opportunity on a nature-based solution here that can relative that can scale relatively quickly. Emma? Yeah, I think we are somewhat bullish on prices going up for carbon in the next five to 10 years. Um, so if we look at the projections of what we would need to sequester to stay within Paris guidelines, there's going to be a big mismatch between carbon sequestration credits demand and what can be provided if we don't include farmland. So with that in mind, we're committed to at least 75% of that increase in price going straight to the farmer. Right now, again, our pilot is taking less than 25% of that value. Um, and so we won't expect to take more than that. And that's in part also from looking back at the carbon, the Chicago Climate Exchange, the CCX. So folks have been in this space for a while, said, yeah, I've seen carbon credits and how did that work? Um, one of the challenges among several were that um, aggregators, project developers, folks in our role took a lot of the value. And so farms ended up seeing very little of the value go back to them. Um, and so we are very committed to not miss, make that same mistake. I'd also say to Lisa's point, we also agree that like this is a industry-wide sort of approach that we are seeing to try to bring this value to farms. And it's not a space that Corteva wants to own, right? So we wanna to collaborate to give you the most choice to fit the right program for the right operation and make it really easy for you to get there, whether it's going through Nutrient or whoever, um, to find the right program that's a good fit for you. So we see prices likely to go up. We wanna make sure that we share that with farms. And then secondly, um, we expect acreages and geographies to go up, especially through partnerships and sort of streamlining this process and the sort of like thicket right now that we acknowledge is out there in terms of all the different programs you have to look at and think through when you're making this decision. Great. Um, so I think I just have kind of one last question and it's really just more of an opportunity to hear from uh, each of you. What what closing remarks do you have for our audience? And, and I think I'd really like to challenge you to think about this or ad address it with an eye toward what thing you think every farmer should know as they're evaluating this whole market incentive landscape. And um, I think we are back to Lisa going first on this one. So, so thanks, Jean. And, um, I, I think it comes down to, you know, evaluate the different programs that are in the marketplace today, understand your operation and which which program you think will be right for you. Because uh, at the end of the day, the program has to work for the farmer or, it's, or we're not going to be successful. Um, we're not going to be successful in generating the amount of carbon credits that we need to to really provide a solution. So would definitely encourage farmers to you know, read the fine print of the contract, make sure you're getting your questions answered, understand the programs before you decide um, to sign up. Great. Emma? Yeah, very similar to Lisa. I think fundamentally these programs have to work for your operation, right? So make sure that agronomically this is a good fit for what you're wanting to do on your farm, whether it's addressing weed suppression or building organic matter. These practices can have a lot of, as Sally mentioned, a lot of additional benefits um, on, on the farm. So really focusing on that. Um, for us in our programs, farmer choice is number one, right? We wanna make sure that you have the choice to do what makes sense for your operation. And so that's why we're really focused on trying to bring partnerships, whether so you can work with your advisors, you don't need to bring a new advisor to the field. So you can use Nutrient, for example, in our current pilot with them in Indiana. Um, and we're also really focused both on that choice, but also on really rigorous scientifically based credits. We think that is the key in order to have valuable credit to like capture some of that carbon price rise, that the, these credits have to be rigorous. So we're really um, committed to trying to figure out 
how do we do this at the lowest cost for the highest rigor and accuracy? And then finally, maybe one last to your point, Jean, what, what I really hope all folks that are farming and have an opportunity to participate are thinking about, the additionality criteria I think are key. If you're making a new practice change, you're sort of holding um, prime assets, right? Those are the highest quality and can get the highest price today in today's market. Um, and so I think it's really important if you're making a practice change to think carefully about which programs you enroll in um, because you sort of have the, the highest quality and have the highest potential there. So bear, definitely read the fine print. Um, if you've adopted practices in the past, there are relatively fewer options. Um, so again, thinking about those practice changes. And then also, these are in pilot phases, but there is a cost for sitting on the sidelines and missing some of these opportunities. So I think it's worth sort of taking that next step uh, to talk to an advisor, a carbon advisor on any of these programs to sort of understand really what are the costs and benefits um, for this year. Great. Sally, I think the last word goes to you. Sure. Uh, not too much to add there. I think you've mentioned it a couple of times, Jean. Be sure you know what you're signing up for when you get into these programs. Um, and, you know, it, it's a, it's a follow a little on what Emma said. It's important to recognize if you're on the verge of implementing new practices, um, you're really at a good point for this, but at the same time, don't let the risk of what you might or might not find out in the carbon market hold you back from implementing good sustainability practices. There's some great opportunities here, but at the end of the day, these, as I mentioned before, these practices have value to the grower beyond these carbon markets and implementing good sustainability practices on the ground is the big opportunity for growers to grow production return on investment and then if we can find the right opportunity to tie into these carbon markets let's do that and help these growers have that opportunity but um i think emma said it earlier growers aren't farming for carbon and we wouldn't want to see growers farming for carbon we want growers to, to do the good job on production that they're, they're doing and, and only help them move forward produce more in a and more environmentally sustainable way. Great. Well, I appreciate each one of you taking the time uh, to share information and answer our questions today. Um, and just uh, wanted to share a few points as we wrap up. And I think, um, Megan, you have a few slides, more slides to share with us. Great. So um, just first, a little teaser, if you are interested in seeking CEUs for this, I just encourage you to get your phone out and ready because we're gonna have the QR code on the next uh, next slide where you can like use your app and get reclaim your credits. Um, as you leave, for everyone though, uh, as you leave today's webinar, a window will open up in your browser with a really short survey that should take you about three minutes to complete. And I really appreciate your feedback. Um, it's it's helpful for us. Uh, this is the first of four. So any feedback you give us, we can um, integrate and make the next three better. Um, so thank you in advance for answering those questions. And um, also invite you to check out the web links for the programs highlighted today, which are listed there on the screen and visit ISAP's website for that resource document highlighted by Emily earlier. And we'll also be posting the recording uh, from today's webinar there later today as well as information for the uh, four, uh, the three additional webinars coming up in the series. We'll continue using this URL throughout the whole series. And then on Friday, you will receive a follow-up email from GoToWebinar with links um, and a summary of all this information too. We're gonna uh, bundle today's webinar and Thursday's webinar together with that follow-up. So. Um, there is that QR code for people seeking uh, continuing education units uh, for CCAs. Um, it's been approved for one and a half hours in soil and water management. And um, if you don't have the app on your phone, uh, don't worry, because we also have a way for you to request credits using um, a form that is linked on ISAP's website and also will be in that follow-up email on the 25th and so you can respond to that and then um, the last slide I think just uh, you know we really will be continuing this conversation in two days and hope you'll join us then on Thursday June 24th and we'll be looking at agricultural data platforms and um, how those platforms help growers intersect with ecosystem markets and then in July we'll have two more sessions looking at market opportunities with grain buyers and CPGs. 
And also looking, looking at some of that additionality or co-benefits that we talked about today, looking through water quality credits um, and other potential revenue streams for ecosystem services. And we're also gonna have a farmer uh, who's been working in this space for many, many years, um, sharing his perspective and really looking forward to that conversation in July. You are already registered for those upcoming webinars. And the only thing you need to do is just double check your calendar to be sure that you've set aside the time, uh, 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Central, and look for email reminders as those dates approach. And thank you again for joining us. I hope you found the discussion informative, and I wish you all a safe and productive afternoon.